thank you very much for Art Basel for inviting me to conduct this interview, the first one for Art Basel this year. So I will first explain the process. In the first hour, we will invite Mr. Liu and Mr. Zhu to do a very simple dialogue. And then in the last half hour, the floor will be opened to all of you. You can ask questions. Now, let me briefly introduce Mr. Liu. I don't think I need to introduce him really, but I think perhaps some of you may not understand very adequately the importance of Mr. Liu, so I will introduce him and Mr. Zhu. Mr. Liu Guo Song in 1932 was born in Shandong in 1949. He went to Taiwan with Kuomintang, and in 1956, he graduated from the Arts Department of the Normal University. And then at that time, he um, formed um, an as a society with the other, other artists. And then later, he went to the U.S., he went to U.S. and Europe uh, on a tour for two years. And then in the 1970s, he was invited by the Chinese University to teach in the arts faculty. In 1972 to 76, he was the department head. And in 1973, in Chinese University, at the extramural study department, he uh, started the uh, modern uh, ink art diploma program. And then later at Iowa University and Wisconsin University of the U.S., he became the uh, visiting lecturer. Mr. Liu taught in Hong Kong and retired in 1992. He then went to Taiwan to teach. During that period, he promoted the techniques of modern ink art in 1980s. Mr. Liu went from Hong Kong to China and he also did roving exhibitions of his ink art pieces. He promoted the art of ink art. In 1998, the Guggenheim Museum organized an exhibition. Mr. Liu's works uh, were displayed. In, 19, in 2008, he won uh, a big art award. And then at the end of uh, October this year, at Taipei, at the National uh, Museum, he's going to have a large-scale exhibition. And uh, his works would also be displayed in Singapore and Malaysia. Mr. Liu's friend, Mr. Zhu Hongzi, now is the deputy head of um, an art society and also an editor of a magazine, art magazine. He's also a writer for the... Uh, uh, CCTV and uh, he organized uh, a large scale award uh, featuring Mr. Liu and in April this year together with Mr. Liu Guosong he um, chaired um, an exhibition and seminar together with Mr. Liu in the past 60 years Mr. Liu did a lot to promote ink art. So I would like Mr. Liu to share with us his path and experience in ink art creation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your introduction. As you all know, all along, I have been advocating modern ink art. Since I was 14 years old, I started to paint traditional Chinese paintings. And then when I was in university, uh, I was influenced by a remark by one of my teachers, and so I changed. At that time, he said that uh, art should originate from life. So I think in the past, I drew so many traditional paintings, but then those did not originate from my life. They were copies of ancient people's lives. So when I was in the second year, I started to learn Western paintings. And then um, those were um, paintings of landscape. So uh, that came from life. And after that, uh, there was 
uh, prosperous development of art. So starting from the year two, well, I thought that uh, Chinese paintings were hopeless. There has not been any development in a number of years. So I think I have actually spent seven years in purely Western art. I started from Impressionist school and then all the way to abstract paintings. And then after uh, working on the Expressionist school in the 50s, in the latter part of 50s, in the whole world, uh, the abstract expressionism uh, was very popular. So later on, I thought, what should I do later? Now, when there was the emergence of a new school, should I then try to uh, copy or learn from the new school, new emerging school? I think that this is problematic. So at that time, I was very determined. I thought that traditional Chinese painters are only uh, copied from the ancient people. And then later on, they uh, followed the Western art development. And later, I realized that I was also copying. I was also replicating. I did not copy the traditional Chinese artists, but the Western artists. So I really had bad feelings because I thought that I was not of any improvement. I think that there should be a new path. So at that time, I introduced a slogan. Perhaps up till now, this slogan is still useful. So I think copying from the new cannot replace copying from the old. And if you copy from the West, it cannot uh, replace copying from the Chinese. There was another wrong concept saying that the ink painting of China was a result of the ancient time. We should need different materials to create contemporary ink paintings, for example, with oil painting materials. And then later on, perhaps you all know about this in Taiwan. I was seen as a subversive figure and no art school dared hire me. And I ended up in an architecture department. But it turned out that this teaching experience impacted on me a lot. For example, their theories on the use of different materials. In other words, if you decide to use a certain material, the qualities of the material should be exemplified. And you cannot use a certain material to replace another type of material. Their theory targets the construction of many houses with reinforcement steel and cement. People are using these materials as a kind of replication of old materials. Actually, in ancient time, people used wooden materials and they will have to paint uh, a coating on it to prevent damage by insects. But there is no problem with insects in the modern day because we use cement.
and concerning the horizontal beams we have to make sure there is even allocation of weight but today when we use cement and reinforcement steel we do not need to worry about the allocation of weight so this is a kind of fraudulent act you are cheating people so I reflected on this situation I used the oil painting format to represent concepts of the ink painting and it was very difficult technically speaking and I had to make the oil thinner so that it is easier to use this is why I think if I want to do ink painting I should still use ink that's the first reason the second reason is for Chinese paintings for five to six hundred years there was a lack of development and the current generation is not as outstanding as the previous one Wang Bikong once wrote a passage and he commented on the paintings from the Tang dynasty and also the Song dynasty and he noted that the use of water in relation to the use of ink the proportion has evolved over the centuries more contemporary work tend to use more water and we are responsible for the restoration of real Chinese paintings we cannot sacrifice the life of Chinese ink painting in the hands of Western art influence so I started abandoning the fusion work of mine that combined characteristics of Chinese ink painting and Western oil painting uh, two of my paintings have been collected by this Zhejiang Museum but I decided that I have to return to real ink painting And I decided to do some experiments beginning from 61 to 63 I went to Taiwan and I bought all sorts of paper for experiments because at the time I thought in human civilization history is created by two types of people scientists and artists they create physical civilization and also cultural civilization scientists are scientists because they have certain ideas They have to prove their ideas are correct and they have to conduct experiments in the lab
and if the result is exactly what he wants, he comes up with an invention, and then he's a real scientist. Without real inventions, he's not a scientist. He can only be a professor in some university. Therefore, painters are just like scientists. Painters must have new ideas, new feelings, new stories, and strong desire to express them on a piece of paper, or on the canvas, or on a scroll. What about old traditions, old materials? What if you cannot express them? You have to do some experiments. So when it comes to innovation, we're also talking about developing new materials. That is also a kind of innovation. At a time, on different paper, I've conducted some experiments. And I found this one type from Taiwan with special type of fiber. After I did a painting, if you turn it to the back, sometimes the fiber will block the ink and you see some white lines and I thought that's beautiful because in Chinese paintings there are only black lines but no white lines. If you can create white lines, isn't that wonderful? So later on, I got this paper manufacturer to create this paper material with two layers. I have been to paper manufacturing facilities And they decided that they can attach another layer of fiber to normal paper. Sometimes the fiber are long strips and I told them not to dispose of certain materials containing plenty of fiber but instead press that layer of fiber onto normal paper after I painted on such materials the color is blocked by the fiber so the paper is still white at the bottom when I remove the fiber layer you can see all the white lines and I was very excited After I got this paper manufacturer to undertake to help me, I just call it a hybrid paper. And in that situation, it was 1963, and between 61 and 63, I believe that was important era. Or many painters were very excited because in the process of experimenting we found new solutions and we found new directions so after two years of work in 1963 I launched this new paper and I started creating with my own style And that is the process of development on the technical level. Now, Mr. Xu, concerning this um, scientific spirit, uh, 
um, there was a lot of debate concerning the impact on ink painting in mainland China. So can you tell us what happened during that time? In the early 60s, now at that time I knew that. Later I went to the US and Hong Kong and in the in early 80s I went to the mainland. And I can say that uh, on the two sides of the strait, there is this um, fad about Mr. Liu. Now, just now you asked me about the impact on mainland China. This is a very interesting topic. Mr. Li Keran is an artist with um, the deepest traditional skills. Now, since Cultural Revolution, at a place in Anhui where Xuan paper was developed, he has spent three years to try to revitalize the technical standard of Xuan paper. Now, if you look at different types of uh, leather or skin or um, weeds or grass, now the uh, Xuan paper cannot uh, attain the standard during Ming and Qing dynasty. Now, this is something that the artists have to solve. The ancient people described a fantastic scene, but it cannot be reached because uh, the uh, standard of uh, the ink and the brush is not adequate. So, Mr. Liu's study on papers is something that all the masters had attached importance to. And later, Mr. Li Keran also said that he had stored some papers from Ming and Qing dynasty. Well, that's done by many um, veteran masters. Mr. Liu had created an important background. We cannot go back to Song and Yuan dynasty. We're talking about uh, water, ink, and brush standards developed at that time. And now if you talk about uh, water and ink, uh, it's difficult because we, have, we must have the uh, crushed ink in order to reach um, the high standard set in the past. So if you use liquid ink, you really cannot get that effect. So I think uh, material is very important. Mr. Liu is regarded as father of uh, modern ink art because he has led to a big reform in terms of technicality. So this is my impression. So should Mr. Liu continue and then later on I can explain my views about his impacts on mainland China. Okay, so Mr. Liu, can you share with us your views about brush and ink regarding brush and ink? Well, it's being used by literati and it's emphasized as the only standard. All paintings after being painted are regarded as good uh, paintings only if they were done by literati. If we look back, if you talk about uh, brush and ink, this is a very interesting concept. If you talk about literati's paintings, um, it is the form of painting in the past few hundred years. At the start of literati's paintings, they represent the point that outsiders or laymen entering the art scene, the laymen uh, led the um, insiders. So if we look at the Chinese painting tradition before the Tang Dynasty, uh, mainly the paintings were literati's paintings and uh, there were 18 uh, ways of strokes. So in other words, uh, people were painted 
by means of 18 different types of strokes. And when there was landscape painting, when landscape painting became an independent type of painting, away from paintings of people, then at that time, the paint strokes of uh, portraits were used to draw rocks and mountains. And then uh, colors were also given to the landscape. That was the early stage of landscape paintings. Later on, the uh, landscape painters realized that by using paint strokes of portraits to draw rocks and mountains, that's not adequate, that's not right, because rocks have their own uh, lines and structures, different types of hills and mountains also have their own lines, shapes and silhouettes. So that's why painters started to create new techniques to depict the silhouette and profile of the hills and mountains. So the new technique is known as Chun or Spring. From Tang and then uh, Five Eras and Song Dynasty, Yuan Dynasty, uh, it was said that there are 36 Chuns. So in other words, there are at least 36 painters who had created their own techniques they have created their own personal styles. After Yuan Dynasty, there was almost no more new Chun or new technique. The emergence of a painting depends on skills or techniques. And very often we, we refer to contents, skills and techniques are two sides of one thing. So with new techniques, there can be new forms, new styles and new contents. Some people advocate that contents is equal to um, forms and forms are created by new techniques. I am a bit curious. In the past 10 years or so, you visited different landscapes in the world and you created new works of Zhou Zai Go and also landscapes of Tibet and in the 60s many of your works are related to landscape big mountains and big rivers so Mr. Liu can you share with us uh, your view about the relationship between in art and nature before I answer your question because just now he talked about the uh, article that I've written, so I would like to supplement a bit. We talked about Literati's paintings, and uh, paintings were done by means of the way of writing. Now, later on, People were of the view that if you did not make use of the way of writing in paintings, that is not a good painting. And uh, in fact, uh, there were a lot of uh, methods of chun or techniques. And later on, it seems that there is only one technique, and that is Zhong Feng, that technique. Chinese paintings used to be very broad, but gradually they are narrowed to a small corner, a tiny corner. So when I took lessons, Mr. Pushi, you made that point as well. We all know that Pushi Yu is actually the last literati painter. 
um, that that point was recognized by the art commentators. And Pu- Mr. Pu Xinyuan said that if you don't use Dongfeng, you cannot uh, come up with good painting. At that time, I have some doubts. Later, I uh, went to the Chinese University. I taught there. And then the Chinese University asked me to be the department head to reform the department. Since I had to reform the department, then sometimes I went to um, various classrooms. I um, waited at the uh, classroom door and I listened to how the teachers taught. And I taught this, and I heard this remark that if you don't use uh, Zhongfeng, you cannot come up with good paintings. Then I think that was very bad. Now, when I was in Taiwan, on a magazine, I wrote an article about techniques. And in the uh, art history, there were some records of painters' techniques not using brushes. And I um, spelt out those techniques to show that it is not really necessary to use brush in paintings. Later, I talked about revolution, about the use of brushes or zhongfeng. And in Hong Kong, Sing Tao Daily uh, featured my article in three batches. And then another magazine in Taiwan also featured my article. And uh, after that, Well, there were many, many people who scolded and criticized me. I could not even respond or reply. I was like uh, being attacked by people from different directions. And one of my friends was one of the uh, persons who criticized me. Well, we used to be very close friends. We uh, worked together and we uh, made dumplings together. and. He, at that time, wrote an article. Uh, He was a tutor in the architecture faculty, and he adopted the architecture's perspective to rebut me, he said. Brush and ink of Chinese paintings are equivalent to columns and pillars in architecture. He said, without columns and pillars and beams, the painting cannot be really a painting. After reading his article, I said to myself, let's talk about this after 10 years. I, myself, am very confident that I am in in the forefront after 10 years he would surely agree with me. And the result is, in less than 10 years' time, the first huge egg uh, stadium of the U.S. was built. That huge egg construction. It's like bird's nest in Beijing. (laughs) So, in that huge egg, there was no column, no pillar, no beam. And I have a friend in Germany, he said, Oh, this huge egg construction was completed. There's no column and no beam. Oh, you are um, a prophet. You are a prophet. And at that time, I did not give any explanation. I did not make a reply. And at that time, I replied. I said, you architects would like to uh, broaden the space in the stadium and you have come up with this method because the columns will block the space and it can only be used for basketball, badminton and tennis but after all the columns and beams were removed then you can play football and basketball there so at that time I can see that the scope of Chinese paintings is too narrow I think that the scope should be widened. So that's why I think that uh, over 10,000 painters had been using the brush for so many years. And so I think actually 
uh, the life of brush can come to an end. So that's why I made that remark. This is something I would like to supplement to what he said just now. So uh, what's your question again? The question I asked just now is about the relationship between in art and nature from the past to now. For example, Jiu Jai Go and Tibet, Chinese paintings, all along. Were such that landscape paintings were the fundamental, were the main uh, types. This is different from the Western paintings. In Western paintings, human beings are the mainstream. Chinese painters make landscape paintings. They seldom do sketches. In mainland China, some people have advocated for sketch painting of landscapes. However, in Chinese paintings, that was not really promoted. If you take my personal experience, in the past, I also did a sketch painting of landscape. And actually, I would like to enlarge that sketch into a big painting. The result is totally unacceptable. Why? Because there were limitations. There were huge limitations. There was not one successful painting or sketch. So I think that in Chinese traditional painting, it's because human beings come up with some feelings of the nature, of nature, and these feelings are formed in their minds and then those were being digested in their bodies when they go back home they just um, reproduce the feelings they, that they have and the whole process is very natural there is no limitation at all so some people often ask me about landscape paintings of Tibet. At the beginning, I put down the name of the place in Tibet, and then some people asked, I have been to that place. Why is it that I haven't seen that uh, landscape, that scene? And I said to, to them, Tibet that I have painted is such that there is that place, but there isn't that arrangement. What I mean is, um, the um, painting, the form is constructed by me. So I think this place should be uh, darker in color, that should be shallower, and so on. In fact, I am against having pre-established ideas in your mind. I think when you paint, it's like playing chess game. You will respond and react after making each move. If you have preconceived ideas, then to be honest, uh, well, for the literati, they don't have too many preconceived ideas. In a landscape painting exhibition, when you enter, you will think that it's like an individual artist's exhibition because the paintings may be very similar. So I think this is a comparison with Western paintings. For Western paintings, human beings are the core. Why? Because they would like to manifest real life. In the past, uh, no matter which um, schools of thought we're talking about, there were people writing poems and it's like a mirror reflecting 
the reality. All the way till now, if you look at Western paintings, there are things or pieces that are remarkable. There are pieces that are horrifying. This kind of paintings are like mirrors. They reflect various phenomena in society, as they are. So, for Chinese paintings, they had to go through digestion and、uh, internalization and deepening before they are being、um, realized on papers. So, these are two different things altogether. When I was in Beijing, when I did exhibition in Beijing, some painters criticized me. They said, "You are not interested in the society. You are not concerned about our society." No. They said that I only live in my own studio, and I just showed them a painting of mine. I asked them, "What do you think of this painting?" That painting was entitled. Nineteenth century, twentieth century, and twenty-first century. So there were two arcs, one on top and one at the bottom, and in the middle there are many circles. On the left-hand side there is the biggest circle, and because the two arcs. Uh, only leave a very narrow space in the center, so the circles are getting smaller and smaller.、Um, the one in the center is the smallest, and then later on the circles are bigger and bigger again. So, I said nineteenth century, twentieth century, and twenty-first century. And after the commentator had、uh, seen that painting, I said to him that. This is my expression and my idea about society. In the 19th century, the Chinese culture was still like a big circle. After the Opium War,、uh, the、um, war including、uh, or involving eight、uh, states, and then there were the European and. American cultures; these two circles are enlarging, and then the Chinese culture circle is getting smaller and smaller. It's like marginal culture. In the 21st century, China is strengthening, so Chinese culture has turned into a big sun. It's illuminating. So does this show that I am concerned about society? He said, "Oh, okay. Now I understand. Very good." So this can be regarded as a landscape painting, but it can also、uh, express our view about our society. Thank you. We have heard so much from Mr. Liu about、uh, ink and brush and landscape painting. I guess now many audiences will have some urgent questions that they would like to ask about Mr. Liu's remarks and career. So, if you have questions, please raise your hands. There will be microphones around. We have around twenty-five minutes. Okay, the one in the center. Mr. Liu, today we have heard so good presentation from Mr. Liu. He is also still very energetic. We are proud of him. About Chuan Fa, you are talking about wind and time. Wind is a natural element, and time is another thing. I remember that some time ago in Hangzhou in a meeting. We said that there's creation and production, and production should come before creation. So you first make your works, and then you emphasize creativity. 
since 61, 62, 63, you started the revolution on papers, and then you did many experiments. I think that uh, these are your techniques about making, and I am more interested in this point. Mr. Liu, you are over 80 years old already. You are very experienced. You have been to many places in China and the U.S. You have got a lot of opportunities. But after you uh, reached the age of 80, I, I believe you will still um, exercise your creativity. You will enhance your creativity. At the end of the day, you have reached a stage in which uh, there can be no more ink and papers. And then I think you can still continue to make a lot of achievements. Concerning your future creativity and your thinking, can you um, elaborate more? Thank you. This question is a very good one. It is also a very sharp question. In the past, there were people criticizing me saying that content is more important, skills are less important. Some people also criticize me for playing with techniques. Just now I was talking about experiments. So my studio became a lab to me. It was not a factory. And when I was the deputy dean for Chinese University Hong Kong, I told people from the very beginning that I would not allow people to copy me. because the traditional cultural or art education is about copying and that's been affected by the same learning pyramid idea so we all have to be like a pyramid and therefore when that is reflected on our painting we will start from copying we will copy other paintings concerning portraits, landscape paintings and we better learn from every single school of art. That is called setting a foundation. When you have a large foundation, when it is wide, you can erect a tall pyramid. And I would say that Um, that school of thought is about learning and copying and then seeking differences and at the end when I was teaching in the mainland I asked my students when there are so many art schools, art departments every year if we look at Chinese paintings alone how many graduates do you have? If you look at people who graduate from Chinese painting, how many have become famous in the world? Dian Feng Mian, Wan Shong Ye, Li Keran. I can give you many more examples. They all started from learning Western painting. Those who were nurtured from traditional Chinese painting, they only built a solid foundation, but they were no different from others. So I thought I should turn things around. We first seek differences. We seek to be different and then seek excellence. 
so my students were told to put away the brushes, just do lines. Because we use lines as a basic structure, so I told my students to draw lines. You can do your lines in your own way. At the end, after one semester, two semesters, I realized there are many new lines formed, not created by brushes. And I told them, do not copy the lines like brushes. Do something different. At the end, they would follow the same learning path until year four. I can give you an example. Li Junyi, a Taiwanese painter, He's very, very meaningful person. Very interesting. He would allow students to choose to take courses from other teachers and he would take the remaining students. Please wait. Please wait. Li Junyi came to the sketching course for year one. And I thought he was a very special person. I did not give him the highest mark. In the second semester when it was over, I gave him the first place in the class before it was holiday time, I told him to come to see me. I asked him, are you from art department? He said, no, I'm from biochem. And I asked, why did you come to my class? He said, I've always loved to paint. And I said, why don't you go inside the art school? And he said, everybody in my family said no, including my two sisters. So at the end, he decided to go to study biochem. And I said, how's that going? And he said, I'm not happy. Then I said, if you love painting, just change over. He said, my parents will never agree. All right, tell your parents to come and see me. And he did. And I talked to them for over an hour. If you love your son, I said, please let him have a good time in the university. He's now in biochemistry department. He's not happy. This is not fair to him. If he's not happy now studying biochemistry, he is not going to find a good job. But if he's allowed to take art, perhaps he'll have a brighter future. I think it is also happening in many schools among many people. In the last year, he was number one in the class, painting, oil painting, installation, sculpture, everything. He was the best. He's never painted any Chinese painting, but his Chinese paintings, they were also the best. Harvard University paid him money to do paintings because it takes him a long time to paint. Their collectors paying advance payment to him. 
to ask him to paint. He decided to first complete the painting for the museum because he understands that once his work is collected by the collector, it will go into a warehouse for a long time. Perhaps we can respond to the question on creation. And what about new experiences? Well, I am answering your question. Because we have to seek to be different first before we seek to be excellent. So you should paint something that is not the same as traditional ones. Something that is different from anyone else so you can create your own style. Perhaps that's why he is so famous today, although he was not widely accepted at the beginning. So this is what I call first seek to be different and then seek excellence. And the studio is like a lab. You have to do experiment and find your own style. If this one doesn't work, try something different. We have to try different methods. That's why I told you the story about finding this new type of paper. I have seen students of the architectural department using different methods. to prepare the building plans. And some of my work has been painted on the paper that's been used by architects to present different ideas to the audience. So you have to experiment and then create your own style, right? I suddenly forgot. Suddenly I have this total blank in my head. When it comes to content. What is the content of your painting? Can someone tell me? During Cultural Revolution, under the rule of Mao Zedong, there's only one topic. Any content you can talk about? It's not about the painting itself. Paintings are used to show a theme outside of the painting. So the content It's about the painting itself. If you look at art history and development, every school is different. Even when they paint an apple, they are different. Why? Because artists, they have different knowledge about the nature of art itself. So it is like a huge elephant and every artist is touching one part of that elephant and then they will approach art accordingly. So what is the content of a painting? Thank you. I wonder if I'm really answering your question. Do we have other questions over here? Perhaps um, this one first. I think in the world, there are many painters and artists 
and you are one of the real masters. Artists have to convey their messages. They have to think out of the box. In your career, is creativity an important element? How did you jump outside of the box? How did you achieve major breakthroughs? Perhaps we can take the next question as well. It's a follow-up. I'm not in the art business, but I came here and I feel that you are a real master. I kept thinking about what am I doing when I was young. I focused on um, improving my technique and I wanted to have my own style. I, I'm just wondering how do we really become a contemporary painter with great achievements so that our marks can be left in this era? How do we reflect what is happening in this era? I think we have to base everything on our own feeling to truly reflect what is happening. So I'm really touched by the style and the efforts of this master because you found your own style you found your own step forward can we really nurture a master? that's my question do you remember the two questions the lady asked where's the energy pushing you to continue to rethink art and can you nurture a master? I will take that question first. The studio is um, a lab. I have talked about this time and again. The studio is a lab. And then some experimental ink paintings emerged because of what I said. I did abstract ink painting and then that space rocket was launched in the States and I had strong feelings. I switched over to something less ab abstract. That is me being influenced by the era. After that, I felt like what I wanted to say has already been said, it's no longer challenging. So I tried something new. I saw this term called water painting. You just drip ink on water and then absorb it with a piece of paper. But that got lost in history. The practice was lost, so I started experimenting with water paintings. And afterwards, I started um, adding things to such water paintings. After a while, I felt that's not challenging, so I wanted to try something different. I went to to cycle because of the influence by the water there. I did some experimental paintings. I use architectural use paper.
and then I went to Tibet and I went to this base for people to climb the highest mountain in the world they told me to stay there for half an hour at the end I saw the clouds moving near the peak sometimes it was dark, sometimes it was bright it was simply very beautiful and I was there for over two hours after I came back I went to Chengdu I paid a big price but that experience drove me to create some new paintings this is a similar story to the white lines I won't repeat that perhaps you can quickly respond to the question about whether we can nurture and master can masters be nurtured I don't think we can nurture masters because nurturing is something external it comes from the environment a master should exist within it is about internal needs he must have strong desire my friends or students when I was studying there were outstanding students in my class or in other classes there was this person uh, two years senior to me and he was very outstanding really great paintings but he vanished at the end so we were in the same environment I was in Taiwan he was in Taiwan I said that copying was new cannot replace copying of something old copying the West cannot replace copying the East I started as a traditional painter and then I moved over to learn from Western art and then many people supported me and then I shifted again and I was very unique because of my practices but if you talk about nurturing someone in a certain environment I would have died already because towards the end I was criticized for my attitude it was an era of white terror can you imagine how many artists or painters can insist on doing what they do and not fearing death so I do not think that we can nurture masters we can nurture people who are neither here or there that's the fact so thank you very much Master Liu for your explanation we now understand more about your ink paintings and why you have become such an important figure you are truly inspiring and I also want to thank Mr. Xu for joining our dialogue and thank you everyone for your attendance at this session thank you very much